Welcome to the third part in the series of videos on the drying of fruits and vegetables. In this video presentation, we will take a look at how drying takes place. My name is Don Mercer, and I am with the Department of Food Science at the Ontario Agricultural College, University of Guelph. We will begin with several acknowledgments, followed by a brief introduction. Then we will examine how a product dries and look at the drying mechanism, consider a bit of mathematics, and then discuss how the endpoint of a drying process can be determined. Once this is done, we will conclude with some summary comments. I would like to thank Mr. Andrew Goodwin, Associate Industrial Development Expert with the Agribusiness Development Branch of the United Nations Industrial Development Organization for his considerable efforts in coordinating this project. I would also like to thank those who are assisting in the presentation of this material to various local groups. Their contributions to our training activities are greatly appreciated. An important part of food drying is understanding how the process takes place. In this presentation, we will examine various aspects of the drying process. Much of this deals with the drying mechanism. We will try to keep the mathematics to an absolute minimum. In addition, don't let any of the terms that we use bother you. When freshly cut, slices of most fruits and vegetables have a thin layer of moisture, that is water, on their surface. And looking at this slice of mango, you may see a shiny watery layer on the surface. We use the term saturated surface to describe what is like a pool of water. When drying begins to take place, water is removed first from the saturated surface and it evaporates from the surface pool. It is then converted into water vapor. The rate at which this water is removed is constant. Therefore, we refer to this part of the drying process as being the constant rate drying period. During the constant rate drying period, the temperature of the material itself may remain cooler than the air in the dryer. So here we have a sample of material in this diagram with a saturated surface. As the heated air blows across the surface, it evaporates moisture from this pool, and we will have a certain temperature of the air. However, the internal temperature of the product may be somewhat lower, and this is due to a process called evaporative cooling, where heat is taken from the material to evaporate the moisture. As water is removed from the saturated surface, Water from the interior of the material diffuses to the surface in an attempt to keep it saturated. So here we have the material once again represented in this diagram by the orange rectangle and we'll draw a center line on that. We have moisture diffusing from the center of the material to the outside surface where it forms this pool and gives us a saturated surface. Eventually, a point is reached where the surface is no longer saturated and the pool of water is no longer present. And you can see in this diagram that there is no pool of water on the surface. So we say that the surface is unsaturated. And once again, there is no water pool here. The length of time for the constant rate drying period tends to vary with different types of materials that are being dried. Constant rate drying periods tend to last most often from one to two hours. The rate of diffusion of water from the interior of the material is not fast enough to keep up with the rate of evaporation of water from the surface. Water that reaches the now unsaturated surface will be removed. This means that there is no longer a pool of moisture on the surface to keep it saturated. As time moves on, the rate at which the water diffuses to the surface will become slower and slower. Because the rate of water removal is decreasing, 
we refer to this as the falling rate drying period. During the falling rate drying period, the rate of water removal is controlled by moisture diffusion to the surface. So here we have the center line in this material and moisture is now diffusing more slowly to the surface where it will be evaporated. So diffusion slows down as the drying process continues. There is a tendency for the material to heat up as drying progresses. So once again we have the material but we have an unsaturated surface now. As the heated air blows across and removes any moisture that's present from the surface, we get an air temperature that is the same as the internal temperature. So the temperatures of the air and the internal temperature are the same and we have no evaporative cooling. Sometimes if the starting material is cold, there is a need for it to warm up before evaporation of the water can begin. This occurs at the start of the drying process and is referred to as the warm-up period. When using fruit or vegetables that are at room temperature, there is usually no real warm-up period that is present. Therefore, drying will begin by going directly into the constant rate drying period. Before we go too much further, there is a bit of mathematics that we should cover. Please don't stress about it, however. When we dry material, we like to know its weight when it goes into the dryer, as well as its moisture content. Sometimes we don't know the actual moisture content, but we may have an idea of the approximate moisture content. The moisture content is often expressed as a percentage of the weight of the material. In the example we will look at in a moment, we have 240 grams of mangoes with a moisture content of 86.14%. This moisture content was determined on a laboratory moisture balance. We can find the weight of water present by multiplying the weight of the mangoes by the percentage of water which we need to convert to a decimal fraction. Therefore, 86.14% will become 0 0.8614. The weight of water will equal the weight of mangoes times the water fraction. That will be 240 grams times 0 0.8614. And that gives us 206.7 grams of water present in the 240 gram sample of mango slices that we are going to dry. We can then find the weight of solids that are present if we recognize that there are really only two components in the mangoes. One of these is water and the other is dry solids. Right now we don't need to worry about what the solids actually are. The weight of solids will be equal to the weight of the mangoes minus the weight of water. So that's 240 grams of mangoes minus 206.7 grams of water and that gives us 33.3 grams of solids being present. There is another useful relationship that says the percentage water plus the percent solids will equal 100%. Basically, if it isn't water, it's solids. Or, if it isn't solids, it's water. We only have to worry about the water and the solids in this relationship. This gives us another way to find the solids present in the sample of mangoes. The percent solids will be equal to 100% minus the percentage of water. So that's 100% minus 86.14% water, which gives us 13.86% solids. The weight of solids will then be equal to the weight of the mangoes times the solids fraction. So that's equal to 240 grams times 13.86% as a decimal fraction which is 0 0.1386 and that gives us 33.3 grams of solids being present 
and this agrees with the value we obtained using the other method. Let's consider a sample of mango slices in a laboratory dryer to show how an actual material dries. We're going to have an air temperature of 50 degrees Celsius and the air velocity will be 0.5 meters per second. The thickness of the slices will be 0.5 centimeters which is equal to 5 millimeters. We have an initial moisture content as we discussed previously of 86.14 percent water. Here we see a graph of the weight of mango slices versus time. The weight of the mango slices in grams is shown on the vertical axis on the left and time is shown on the horizontal axis at the bottom and it is expressed in hours. What we have here is 240 grams of material at the start and since 86.14 percent of it is water that gives us 206 0.7 grams of water as we showed in the previous calculation. We also have 13.86 percent solids which gives us 33.3 grams of dry solids and I've shown these two weights on the graph as horizontal dashed lines and you can see that the weight change is due to the removal of water. You also should note the shape of the curve this is very characteristic and we're going to do some more work with it as we move through this presentation. Notice how the weight of the mangoes approaches the weight of the dry solids as more and more water is removed. And of course you can remove the water by evaporation but the dry solids will always be there. Once again we have the same graph as before and I've shown the fresh mango slices in the dryer so that you can appreciate what is going on. Now what we're going to do is draw a straight line downwards from the initial weight of 240 grams and we want that straight line to lie as close as possible to the straight portion of the green curve as it moves from the top left to the bottom right. So what you'll see is a point at which the straight line and the green line part company and I've indicated this with a vertical dashed line. So the straight line shows us the constant rate drying period which ends where the dashed line and the solid line cross each other. The time at which the constant rate drying period ends is approximately two hours and after the end of the constant rate drying period we have the falling rate drying period and as you look at this diagram you will see that there is no warm-up period. So please note that the usual approach is to plot the moisture content on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis but having the weight on the vertical axis gives us the same shape graph and for our purposes here it illustrates the concepts just as well. So here we have a diagram of the general drying mechanism. We have dry basis moisture listed on the vertical axis but we could have also plotted weight here instead of the dry basis moisture. The really important thing to notice is that we begin on this graph with a warm-up period from points A to B and that's generally a horizontal portion of the graph where not very much weight is lost at all and on many of the experiments that I've done in the lab there is absolutely no warm-up period involved. However in some of the large industrial dryers that I've worked with we do have a warm-up period present and we have to compensate for that in the drying. Going from points B to C on this graph we have a relatively straight line period which corresponds to the constant rate drying period and that's when moisture is being evaporated from the saturated surface where we have that pool of moisture that we mentioned previously. Going from point C to D you can see that the graph now begins to have a more appreciable curve and that's because we're at the end of the constant rate drying period 
and the diffusion of moisture from the inside of the material to the surface is controlling the rate of drying. And as the rate of water removal gets slower and slower, the graph will become less steep. And that's the portion of the graph where we're heading towards point D. So that's basically the general drying mechanism that you will see as you do your drying work. If you happen to plot the weight or the moisture content of the material that you're drying. Before we leave the discussion about how the mangoes in this example dry, we should also consider how we determine the end point of the drying process. In a laboratory setting, we can monitor the process quite closely and predict when the material will reach the target final moisture content, which is usually around 10% moisture. For small-scale operations which are not equipped with the same monitoring devices, this is a bit more difficult. When working on processes such as this, experience is a major factor. If you dry the material at a moderate temperature, which is in the range of 50 degrees Celsius to 55 degrees Celsius, you should be able to predict the end point based on the texture or feel of the product. Usually the final product will feel dry to the touch and have a leathery texture. The product, such as dried mangoes, will be pliable and it will bend easily without cracking. If the dried material is too dry, it will become brittle and crack when bent. A visual inspection of the color, etc., can assist you once you know what a satisfactory endpoint looks like. A taste test of the material will help as well, but you have to let the product cool down for a few minutes before checking it because warm products tend to be soft and it's not until they cool down that you're going to get a true appreciation of what the texture and taste are like. Another look at the graph for the mango drying will give us a good indication of how long the drying of mangoes will take. We will also discuss this when we consider mango and tomato drying in more detail in a separate video. So once again, here is the graph of the weight of mango slices versus time. What we're looking at now is the horizontal line that corresponds to the weight of the dry solids that are present. And we've previously calculated that that is 33.3 grams of dry solids that we have in the 240 grams of starting material. The shape of this graph shows us when moisture is being lost. As long as the graph is moving downwards to the right, we know moisture is being removed from the mango slices. When the curve begins to level off, we know that we are nearing the end point. The end point from this graph would be at about 11 to 12 hours. Based on the graph in the previous slide, about 12 hours would be needed to dry the mango slices under the conditions that we used in this trial. Your times will vary, but you should expect a time of around this value of 12 hours. It might be longer or it may be a bit shorter. Once again, this is something that you will learn from experience. If you have suitable equipment for monitoring moisture levels, the situation becomes easier. For comparison purposes, let's take a look at how Roma tomatoes dry under similar conditions to those used for the mango slices. We'll have an air temperature of 50 degrees Celsius. We'll have an air velocity of 0.5 meters per second and we actually have a special device that we can measure the air velocity in the lab with. We'll cut the tomatoes into wedges and each wedge will represent one-eighth of the tomato. And the initial moisture content as determined using a moisture balance was 93.80 percent. So here is the graph of the drying of tomato wedges with the weight of the wedges on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis. We're starting out with approximately 400 grams 
of tomato wedges with a moisture content of 93.8% water and that tells us that we have 375.2 grams of water present in the 400 grams of starting material. From this we can figure out the weight of dry solids that are present in the tomatoes and that will be equal to 6.2 percent of the starting weight which corresponds to 24.8 grams of dry solids. And once again the weight loss is going to be due to the removal of water. Now we'll take a look at the drying mechanism. We'll draw a straight line from the initial point of 400 grams downwards to correspond to the linear portion of that red graph and that is indicated by the black solid line. Then we'll drop a perpendicular dashed line from the point where the black straight line and the red curve begin to part company. And as you know, the point at which that happens is the end of the constant rate drying period. Looking at the value on the bottom axis, the time at which the constant rate drying period ends is approximately two hours, which is the same as it was in the case of the mangoes, and that's purely a coincidence. After the end of the constant rate drying period, we go into the falling rate drying period, and once again there is no warm up period present in this example. We should also include another material for consideration, and for that purpose I have chosen hot yellow peppers. The air temperature was 50 degrees Celsius, just as it was in the case of the mango slices and the tomato wedges. I've also used an air velocity of 0.5 meters per second and the peppers were sliced lengthwise into quarters. The initial moisture content was 92.85% and once again this was determined using a laboratory moisture balance device. Here we see the graph of the weight of the hot yellow peppers versus time and again you get that characteristic shape which falls quite rapidly from the top left towards the bottom right and then the slope gradually gets less and less as you go on in time. So we're going to add a horizontal dashed line at the start which tells us we have 220 grams of material and since that material contains 92.85% water we can calculate that we have 204.3 grams of water present in the starting sample of hot yellow peppers. Similarly, we can do a horizontal dash line to describe the weight of the dry solids. We have 7.15% solids present and from that we can calculate that there are 15.7 grams of dry solids in the original 220 grams of starting material. And as you know the weight loss is due to the removal of water. Again we will draw a straight line that corresponds to the linear portion of the graph for the drying of these hot yellow peppers. We'll draw a perpendicular dashed line downwards that corresponds to the point where the constant rate drying period ends. So what we find here is that the constant rate drying period lasts for only about 1.5 hours into the run and after that we enter in to the falling rate period. And once again there is no warm up period involved in this process either. Now let's compare the drying of the three materials. On this graph I have plotted something called the moisture ratio versus time and this is just a little trick we use to get the same starting point for all of the materials. We could have also plotted the weight here but since the weights are different that would make it hard to compare the drying mechanism for each of the three of these products. So don't worry about the vertical axis. What I want you to look at is the individual curves for each material. The mango slices dry the fastest 
And you can tell that because the green line is going down more steeply at the start and reaches a lower level faster than the tomato wedges, which in turn dry faster than the quartered peppers. So in summary, the mechanisms by which materials dry can be quite complicated when you go into the actual details. Basically, the thing to remember is that water removal during a drying process is something that depends on time, and it cannot be rushed. There are things that you can do to enhance the rate of drying to a certain degree. We will look at these in the next presentation where we consider the factors that influence drying. While information presented here may be beyond what you feel is needed, I sincerely hope that it has made you more aware of the basic principles involved in the drying of fruits and vegetables. Please do not fall into the trap of losing track of the basic mechanisms by which drying takes place. That can only lead to failure. Thank you very much.